Hey, what's up guys? I am Joe from Workbench, and today we're gonna to talk about how to make wood grain with shape layers. All right, so today we're gonna to talk about how to do some wood grain with some shape layers. We're also gonna use trap code sound keys to make kind of an interesting visualizer thing. And there's also a giveaway at the end of the video. So let's get started with this mishmash. So the first kind of wood we're gonna have is this like figured looking thing here. It could be like a cocobolo or something like that. I don't know. This one's made rather simply. Most of it's done with a turbulent displace on top here. We just have some softly curving lines other than that. It's all built with this one straight line. Turn this back on. If we open this up, we can see what we did. We basically have our one path across here, and it's actually quite big because we're shifting it so that the animation can come in at different times. Because if we repeated this up and down without any offset, we wouldn't be able to stagger these trims like that. All right, so we have our copy set up over here. And we have just a little expression on this thing that just makes sure that we offset so that our copies go both directions instead of just down. So I just pick whip that and then divide it by negative two. They're all set up like that pretty much. So in our repeater, we just have the position moving everything down 21 pixels. And then we have a wiggle path set to size of 33 and a low detail of nine. And the points are set to smooth. I messed with the correlation a little bit and I guess I only ended up 1% off. And then I messed around a little bit with the temporal phase. All right, then we have a wiggle transform, and this is pretty much just shifting everything way out in X to get that stagger like I was talking about. So the rest of these wood textures are pretty much built the same way. They just have different settings. So if you need anything like this, I'm gonna have the project file available for you guys to download and take a look at them. So if we go in here, see so we have this basically the same setup, repeater, wiggle paths, just have different settings up in here. Have a larger size and a little bit more detail. That's about it on that one. And then we have the same kind of thing with wiggle transform and shifted the same amount in X. So then in wood two, we have one that looks like this. We just kind of space everything out a little bit more and change a little bit of the values in our wiggle paths. So here our size is low and our detail is high. All right, wood three is just a little bit different. We're not using turbulent displace. So we're just wiggling the paths themselves and that's it. Even with smooth settings, this gets you kind of janky edges. So I recommend using turbulent displace if you want it to be a little smoother. And then we did some rings that look like this. And here, instead of repeating up and down, our repeater basically repeats in scale. Our scale is set relatively low, 107%. And here to get that stagger like we did in the previous ones, we actually have to use rotation. So our wiggle transform here just affects the rotation. Then we have a wiggle paths with a pretty high size and a low detail. This one doesn't have turbulent displace, but it could if you want to. And that is it for the wood portion of the show. So that wood texture stuff is pretty useful, but I wanted to make something that was more visually interesting and that maybe moved since we're doing animation. So I took some of the techniques that we just talked about and kind of applied them in a different way. So using trap code sound keys, I split off a couple of frequencies from an audio track to drive some of this animation. I really like how that abrupt stop actually travels through the whole thing. It's pretty neat. All right, so let's check out how this is built. It's a simple setup, but there's a lot of complex stuff interacting here. So first let's check out our controller layer. This is where the data from sound keys is piped into. Amplitude comes from a large section of the frequency range, and detail comes from more from the bass later on in the song. The basic idea here is that amplitude is going to drive how much this stuff moves, and detail is going to increase the amount of bumpiness to this. So you can see in the beginning here, we don't really have too many bumps, but later on in the song, we get a bunch. And that's where that bass starts to kick in a little bit. All right, so let's hit EE to open up all of our expressions. So you can see, as I said, amplitude is directly from sound keys as output number one, and detail comes from output number two. If you don't have sound keys, you can convert audio to keyframes, and any effects you apply to that audio track before running that will affect the data you get out of it. So you can use different things to isolate that. I believe I explained that in a previous tutorial, so I'm gonna try to find that and put that in the description. That said, it won't be as good as trap code sound keys will be. So if you can, I would definitely recommend getting that from Red Giant instead. All right, so our next thing here is pulse. These are set up to be a range from zero to one out of sound keys. So basically in pulse, we're taking the inverse of detail. Peak is the same thing, but we're taking the inverse of amplitude. These are here from experimentation, but I only used one of them. There's also a few other sliders in here that we'll reference later on. So let's look at one of these rings. The first one down here, you can see we have a slider called delay. This delay is gonna be run through value at time on a lot of these expressions, so that we delay as we go from the center outward. So let's click on the slider and open up Expressionist so you guys can see this. All right, we're gonna load this one in. We'll resize this window. All right, so keep in mind, these are all duplicated layers, so every other ring layer is just like this one. So our delay expression is basically the index of this layer, 
And initially I was subtracting away the parent, which would give us an offset from the parent controller. But I wanted that workbench in the middle of the pulse so everything else can be delayed by a little bit more. Otherwise, the first ring would be at zero time and then the next one would be delayed by whatever setting we have. This way, the first one is actually a little bit delayed from the music as well. If that doesn't make sense, don't really worry about it. It's not too important. All right, so basically we have the index of this layer times that delay slider value from the controller. And this actually could be this dot parent dot effect since this is parented. And then we multiply that by this comp dot frame duration. That lets us put that value in frames. I think it's currently set to 0.3, so it's like 30% of a frame. So the delay between each one of these is actually less than a frame. All right, so let's go to our next one. We have rotation here. And on this one, I'm just setting seed random using the index of this layer and setting timeless to true. So you might remember setting timeless to true, make sure that this value doesn't change every frame. So we're gonna set R to a random value between zero and 90. And to that, we're gonna add time minus this layer's particular delay times 10. Since time is in here, our layer is going to rotate automatically. So this basically picks a random angle for our layers to start at. And then depending on their position in the stack, they'll rotate at a different rate. All right, so let's, let's check out opacity. Pull that one in. So we're basically doing that same seed random index true thing. And then we're going to get a random value between 10 and 100. So these layers will vary from 10% opacity to 100%. All right, those are the easy ones. So let's hit EE and open up the rest of them. All right, so here in size... We're going to make sure that every one of these circles is bigger than the one above it in the stack. So to do that, we're going to set i equal to this dot index minus this dot parent dot index minus one. This is like what I was talking about before, where we're going to subtract the index of the parent. So this makes sure that our index is technically going to be relative to our parent. So you can have a bunch of layers on top of it and it won't really affect your index value. Otherwise, like if this was the 10th layer in the stack, you're going to start with 10 instead. I want to make sure that the first one of these isn't any bigger than I set it to be. Let's go through a quick example to make sure that this makes sense. Say this is the third layer. Our parent is the second layer. This would be three minus two, which will leave us with one, and then we're gonna subtract one. So we're gonna do that so that our first one is zero. So our first layer under our controller null is always gonna be zero. So that means that our size isn't gonna increase any. So then we're gonna take i and we're gonna multiply it by that spacing slider that we have in our controller. So if it's 10, every one of these will be 10 bigger than the next one. The first one would stay the same size because it would be just be zero times that value. The next one would be one times it, then two times it, and so on. So then we're just gonna take value, which is its current size, and to that we're gonna add an array because value is two dimensional, and that's just gonna be i comma i. All right, in our next one, we have size. Let's actually open these up so that you can see them a little easier because it's not size of the ellipse in this case. It's size of our zigzag. That's what we're using to get all these bumps. So let's pull that into here. And here we're going to set D equal to this layer's particular delay. And then here we're using that pulse value, which if you don't remember is one minus our detail setting. So then we're going to get our controller's amplitude and we're going to get its value at time. And it's going to be time minus our delay. And since this value is from zero to one, we're going to multiply it by 60. So our minimum zigzag size will be zero and our maximum will be 60. And that will be times that pulse amount. At its largest, this pulse amount can only be one. So basically, since that's connected to detail, if our detail is zero or low, this zigzag value can be higher. But when we have a lot of detail, so a lot of these bumps, this value will be lower because we'll be multiplying by a number less than one. So we'll have smaller bumps. That's to stop this from getting like really pointy, basically. All right, in our next one, we have our ridges per segment. And this is set up similarly. We have our delay set up as D. And then here, since I don't want this value to be zero, we're gonna start off with two. And then to that, we're going to add that detail dot value at time, time minus our delay, multiplied by 60. So again, detail can be from zero to one. So if this is zero times 60, it's zero. So we're going to be left with two. If this is one, this will be 60 plus two. So our range is from two to 62. All right. And that's actually the last thing we have set up for this ring layer. So once you've built that and you duplicate this out like 40 something times and you hit play, you'll end up with something like this. I use this stacking technique with delays to make complex animations all the time. So hopefully that helps you guys out. But before we end this, let's talk about that giveaway thing. So as you might have seen, lately we've broken 15k. Never got around to doing a 10k video, so sorry. But I was contacted by Amazing Music Tracks, and my wife thought it would be a great time to do a giveaway. 
So they generously offered us a package for a winner and an affiliate code. So if you win, you can get five free tracks, a 50% off reusable code for up to 50 tracks, and a 30% off reusable code for up to 100 more tracks. So if that sounds like something you're interested in, and I mean, who really doesn't want free music? Follow us at workbench.tv, then tweet out your favorite Workbench tutorial and tag us at the end. From that, we'll select a winner at random. Maybe via After Effects. I'm not sure about that yet. I feel like this might be an interesting way to see which tutorials you guys really like and find helpful, and then also share those with people that we know. And even if you don't win, you can still use our affiliate code WORKBENCH10 at AmazingMusicTracks.com. All right, if you have any comments or questions, leave them in the comments down below. And if you'd like to help support what we do, check out Patreon.com slash WORKBENCH. Make sure you follow the blog at WORKBENCH.TV. And as always, I am Joe, and I'll see you guys next week. Bye.